This is an oral history interview conducted for the Witness to War Serving a Nation project at Nauset Regional High School in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. For the sake of this interview, please state your full name and community in which you now reside. My name, full name is Anthony J. Chapman, and I live here in Orleans, East Orleans, Main Street, and I work for the school, Nauset uh, Regional Middle School. This is my 10th year. How did you end up on Cape Cod? How did I end up on Cape Cod? I was born here. Can you talk a little bit about your childhood? Um, well, I was, I was born on the Cape and I was raised in Hyannis. And um, I went to Bossville High School. Um, I uh, had a busy childhood, very busy. I was bad, mm -hmm. a lot of fighting. Um, great mother, great father, great good family, big family, and Portuguese type of family. And uh, I went to good school. Yeah. Mm. Can you describe the fond your fondest childhood memory? My fondest childhood rem memory was swimming at the beach. A lot of fun. I had a lot of fun, and walking the beach with my father, pitching stones in the in the water. Yes. Were you always always interested in the war as a boy, or did you become more interested as a teen? Um, right at, after I got out of school. Right when I graduated, that's when I went into the military. Yeah. Kept me out of trouble. Did any like member of your family serve in the military before you? Yes, my brother Bill. My, he's the oldest. He went to Vietnam. Really? And uh, he was a Marine. And uh, he was the one who actually dragged me by my ear to go into the military when I graduated. How old were you when you joined the military? I think I was in my 30s. I was, um, I first went into the Guard, National Guard, and it was a police unit, so I was an MP. And it was, um, I don't know if you know about the, the armory across from the town hall in Hyannis. Um, it's still there, that's uh, the armory where um, President Kennedy gave his um, announcement that he was going to be president, and that's where I trained. Yeah. Um, who was the most supportive person when you entered the military? Oh, everybody. Everybody. The whole family, my friends, everybody. What was the training like before war? Well, when I first went into the military, like I said, I was a police, uh, MP police. So we did a lot of ro uh, riot control and learning how to, you know, say the Miranda rights. Um, I like that. Who did you leave behind and what was it like? Who did I leave behind? My family. And like what? What, what do you mean? What? Like how did, how did you feel about it? Like what was... Oh, your... oh, you mean de being deployed into a, uh, into a war? Yeah. Oh, I was scared. I was terrified. Um, and you know, one of the the one great thing about being deployed into a, um, a war, especially now, is that you don't pay any taxes. So now, no taxes was taken out of my money. So when I got paid, I got paid without any taxes being cut. So I, I made a lot of money while I was over there in Iraq. Describe the impact your service had on your family. Um, uh, well, they missed me. And they missed me a lot, and they were worried. So I stayed in contact with them while I was over there. Um, we, uh, you know, at the time when I went in, we didn't have any of these uh, cell phones that we have now. So every so if he had to make a phone call home, 
you had to go into a certain area. It was kind of like a phone booth, and it was blocked off, so it was real quiet because there was always weapons being fired in the background so I could talk to my family. When you, what war did you serve in? Uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. That was right after um, 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 the first Gulf War, after Saddam um, invaded Kuwait. And you know, then the president declared war you know, on Iraq. And uh, the first um, operation was Operation um, uh, Desert Storm. And then the second one was Operation Iraqi Freedom. And that was the one that I served in. And that was from uh, 04 to 05. When you were in Iraq, who did you miss the most? Um, my kids. I have uh, two daughters and I missed them the most. Um, describe the most interesting place you visited while in the military. Baghdad. What was it like? Just like the Arabian Nights. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of, it was noisy, very noisy, because there was merchants and storekeepers, you know, and uh, kids playing in the streets. Um, a lot of music. Arabic music, and um, you always heard the, the call of the call of the prayer all the time, and um, kids always running up to me, American, American, you know, and holding my hands and stuff, something like that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So they really liked that you were there. Well, they liked me because I spoke a little bit of Arabic, mm -hmm. and they found that really um, um, exciting that I could understand some things that they, they were, some words they were saying. Um, what happens if you break the rules in the military? Like what type of punishment could you face? Like, what um, you, like Well, unlike in, in civilian world where you could probably, if you got into an argument with your boss, you probably could just leave, you know, walk away. But in the military, you couldn't do that. If you're found, you know, in trouble or guilty about something, you had to stand there at um, at attention, you know, and be, uh, you know, chewed out. Yeah. Did you ever break any of like the rules that you had? Um, I missed a formation once, and I got uh, chewed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very um, stern about making, you know, being on time and never being late. So a lot of times when guys would come onto the base, they were speeding and uh, actually just, you know, making a skid mark, getting out and running to the f formation and going behind the formation and then getting right, right in. Because my, my position where I was to stand was always there. Nobody ever took it. So I had to go right into it sneakily like, like that. And then they would see me. What was different in Iraq than America? Like, for example, like the laws and just like the way people lived. Well, during the war, there was very there was any laws. I mean, it, it was like um, you know the wild wild west. You know. Are you still in contact with anyone who you served with? Well, um, I have to be honest. When I left the military after I um, retired. I said I would never go back to the base, Otis Air Force Base. And no, I have seen nobody. And to be honest, I really don't want to see anybody. There's a lot of people uh, in the military that I would like to forget. How long did you serve for? 20 years. Um, could you describe horrors you witnessed during the war? Uh, horrors you witnessed during the horrors? war? Horrors? Yeah. Like what made you not want to go back? Well, you know, I'm, I, can I can I can I say like I still see a psychiatrist? Yeah. Yeah, I see a psychiatrist because I'm a P, PTSD, mm -hmm. and um, uh, a lot of smells would trigger trigger me off. Um, a, a smell of you know, can I say this burning flesh, stuff like that. And uh, since the city was being, a t you know, was under siege, Baghdad, it was a beautiful city. 
but there was a lot of parts of that Baghdad that were, um, I don't know if you've seen the news where Syria, it looks like that. A lot of burnt out houses, burnt out buildings, no windows, uh, bullet holes everywhere, okay? And burning tires, burning vehicles, burning tanks, uh, and garbage in the streets everywhere, garbage. Because there was no sewage, everything was blown. So sewage would flow into the streets um, regularly. So there was a lot of smell that, um, that, uh, that I remember. And um, actually pulling up into a, into a village and seeing a, uh, a dead body on the, on the ground. And you know, we just keep on driving. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were civilians, kids, people like women. What was the scariest experience you had? Scariest? Yeah. Um, being in a, in, in a convoy, and uh, on my way to Iraq, we were in a convoy. The convoy was about a mile long of hum Humvees, um, military trucks, and um, uh, we got we had a lot of air support and. We're driving very fast through the desert, so we're kicking up a lot of dust. Everybody was just talking, pretty happy, you know, and excited about um, getting closer and closer to Baghdad so we can get out, you know, and shower, whatever, rest and eat. And all of a sudden, um, there was a big bang, an explosion, and uh, it was an I not, a, not, not an IED, it was a... Um, a rocket propelled grenade that hit the first vehicle uh, that was the, in the, at the lead. And it blew it up. And uh, every vehicle at that point stopped. And we, um, whenever we get an attack and we're moving around along like this, if there was an attack, the vehicles would move off like that. We would exit the vehicles and form a, uh, a perimeter. Otherwise, I would fall to the ground behind a dune or anything and take cover. And uh, then another vehicle was hit. Boom. And that vehicle, when it went off, it pushed me up against uh, another vehicle. And the implosion was so strong that I started bleeding out of my nose and out of my ears. And uh, I kind of like, um, I was dizzy. And um, I wiped the blood off my, you know, out of my ears because I didn't want any of my fellow soldiers to see that. And I, you know, because it was a, there was this cold, like you know, you know, you never want to show any weakness. And I never wanted to show any weakness to anybody. But um, and a, after the the attack, everybody regrouped it back into their vehicles, and um, I did get off a few shots. I was firing in the direction that they pointed at, but we actually we couldn't see any any anybody out there because there was there's this desert blindness from the sun. I mean the sun was really bright, you know, and um, we f I fired into a di to that direction, but I didn't really see anything that I hit. And once it stopped, and the crew started coming in to clean up the mess and everything, nobody was hurt in the vehicle any attack and um, and then we just carried on but that was terrifying I, I actually peed my pants <laughs> uh, during what time of your service did you feel your life was threatened every day especially um, a lot of times they would put me into a detail where I would take Iraqi citizens and fill sandbags so I always felt threatened because I was with them alone, and um, I was instructed, you know, to protect them as well as myself. I wasn't really afraid of them as much as I was afraid of somebody that I didn't know, because I always saw the same Iraqis, and a lot of them were just kids, you know. What was it like to travel in Iraq? Fast. 
everywhere we went, we went fast. We never drove slow. We were always tied, told to drive fast because um, you don't want to be caught into a, an ambush. You never wanted to turn off into a side road and be ambushed. So everywhere we went, we went fast, either by vehicle or by helicopter. So I did a lot of travels, my um, hum, um, Humvee and um, Black Hawk. Describe a typical day in the military in Iraq. Um, well, you get up in the morning and uh, we would have a meeting with our first sergeant. Everybody was in full ge uh, gear, battle gear, and we would, you know, talk about what we were going to do. A lot of times we would have to go into the villages and search every, each, in each and every house to look for weapons and talk to the, uh, the village uh, chieftains and ask them if they've seen any, any um, activity, like any, um, as they called them back then, um, insurgents. Uh, you know, kind of like another name for a terrorist. And um, um, a lot of my days were spent just uh, sitting, sitting, sitting around in a, uh, a bunker or sandbags and a, you know, and a, a, a weapon looking down um, the perimeter and just watching. But a lot of my days were boring, waiting. What was the food like, breakfast, lunch, dinner? Um, sea rations. You know, you mix it with water, shake it, kind of like the food that uh, the astronauts would have. Yeah. Yeah. I lost a lot of weight. <laughs> Could you discuss your personal job, like in the military, something that you had to do, and the effect it had on others? Well, um, when I first uh, went to Iraq, they put me on guard duty, and I was always in guard duty. Either I was in a tower, overlooking a perimeter, or I was um, at gate guard, where a vehicle would pull up to the gate, halt, you know, and question, you know, the civilians, what are you doing here? And um, we would check the vehicle for any bombs, explosive devices. And then there was a roving guard. That's when I would actually walk uh, the perimeter, a, ve uh, a fence, and on the other side was the enemy, and on the other side was, um, you know, uh, the, the military. And um, for a little bit, they had me delivering mail, or count mail. Mail was a very important thing in Iraq. Why was mail so important? Well, because they had contact with their family, contact with them. Now remember, this was all before they had cell phones. When I left, there was no such thing. Otherwise, um, I'm, I'm quite sure people are texting now a lot more. But at that time, everybody received mail, food, you know, cakes or whatever, uh, care packages. I got a lot of care packages. I would take a lot of the care packages and give them to, uh, to the Iraqis. Give them soap, toothpaste, underarm deodorant, whatever, candy to the kids. You know, they loved it. They loved the candy. How did that make you feel? Good, good. They were good kids. I mean, they were just kids. You know, kids are the same everywhere. It doesn't matter. They they all wanted to play. They liked to play soccer. I played soccer with them. Some of them had bikes. You know, and I would get on a bike. <laughs> So you got close to the Iraqi kids? Yes, I got close to the Iraqi kids and close to a lot of the, uh, the adults, yes. How did it feel having to leave them when you were moving around? Leave them? Like when you were going to a different place, how did it feel when you left like the group of kids or going home? Oh, I worried about them, mm -hmm. yeah. I worried about them because um, at the time I worried about them, whether or not I would see them the next day because uh, they were always under threat. You know, from um, being recruited, you know, by uh, insurgents to fight, fight for them. A lot of them just wanted to come on the base and make money. You know, and when they would work for um, 
for us, you know, filling sand, sandbags, cleaning up in an area, we would pay them. And they would take that money and feed their families. Yeah. What was the most interesting thing you saw? Interesting thing. Um, I don't know if you ever seen it, but uh, they're like two swords, gigantic swords, like a gigantic monument sword crossing each other like this. And it's the area where Saddam Hussein would have parades and it would march underneath those swords. They were gigantic Arabic swords and they crossed like that. And when I saw that, I would say, yeah, I'm really here in Iraq, you know. And then I would take, I would walk through that area and I would see Saddam Hussein's uh, gold bath uh, toilets, fixtures, everything was gold, everything. Huge palaces over there. Did and I would ever see him? No. No. Did you see the inside of the palace? Yes, yes. What, what yeah. was it like? Gigantic chandeliers. I have a picture, but I don't, I don't have it with me. But I'm, you know, in my uniform, and I'm in one of his palaces. It's one of them. And um, chandeliers and everything was made out of marble. Beautiful, beautiful palace. And it was on one of his. One of his. And we used the building as a headquarters. Describe your most joyful experience during war. Leaving. <laughs> Coming home. <laughs> Why did it make you so happy? Well, you know, I mean, I would get, you know, go home to see my family finally. And I think at the time I had one more year of military service. One more year, it would have been 20. So I was very excited. And I had a lot of money in the bank, so, you know. <laughs> and I had my legs and my arms, so I was good. <laughs> what was the thing you looked forward to most when you left the military? <sighs> Getting in my car and speeding off the base. <laughs> and I did. I did. I finally got out. I finally did it. Describe your life after the war. Did it, like, change? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when I when I first got out, you know, everywhere that I went, people were always saying, you know, thank you for your service. That was a little uncomfortable, although they told us that's, that's what would happen. Everywhere I went, people were saying that. So that was a little nerving, you know, because I really didn't feel like I did anything. Describe your biggest obstacles returning to daily life at home. Well, when I first came home, I couldn't sleep for a long time. I was up, you know, through the night when my family was sleeping. Any kind of noise would, would you know, set me off. Um, I was home during the 4th of July, and when I heard all the fire, fire cracks going off, I, I jumped up and I started panicking. I thought we were under attack. Silly me. <laughs> Forgot that I was home. Were you proud of your service? At the time, yes. Are you still proud of it now? Yeah, yeah I am. You know, I mean, at the time when I was in the military, that was something you couldn't, you couldn't ask me when I was serving. Because there was, we just couldn't speak politics. We had to do what we were told and, you know, President Bush was my, my president, my commander in chief, and I treated him like that, you know. What was the most important lesson you learned? That, um, that war is messy, very messy. And um, um, people, are, people are the same everywhere, it doesn't matter. What do you think about the spread of ISIS? What do I think? I think that I'm glad I'm not in the military anymore. <laughs> that I don't have to fight them. Yeah. I, is that good? Yeah. <laughs> if you could go back to the war, would you do, would you and why? Hmm? If you could go back to the war, would you and why? No. No, I wouldn't. No way. Why not? Once is enough. OK. 
Okay. I made a lot of enemies over there in the unit. In my the unit that I served. And um it's not fun, you know, going throughout the whole day not showering and um, brushing your teeth and uh some days going through the day without eating, you know, and um sleeping throughout the night or trying to sleep throughout the night while while rockets are going off in the background and you don't know if they're gonna hit the building or not where you where you're sleeping. I wouldn't I don't wanna go through that again. And I know it's even worse. Uh, so was it, it was difficult adjusting to life at home? Civilian life, yes. Took me a long time to settle down and realize that I'm home. And uh, get used to all the quietness. And how quiet it was. You know, but I was very happy. Was there anything that you learned from the military that you use in your everyday life? Oh yeah, yeah. When I first came here to apply for this job, you know, um, I think it's good to, to hire anybody that's in the military, man or woman, because you have a, a certain kind of uh, discipline, and um, it's something that I use right here. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, the military teaches you how to, how to be disciplined, quiet, you know, and um, do what you're told. And uh, that's something that I carried over, and when, and when I applied here, I told them all of that. And, um, yeah. If a family member told you they were interested in war, what would you say if they were interested in joining the military? Um, well, it depends on what kind of military they're going in. Uh, there is somebody in my uh, immediate family that's in. He's in the Marine Corps right now. And um, I didn't want him to go in there and, you know, to the infantry, but um, he did go in and um, it's it's just not what you think it is. It's definitely not a movie. And um, uh, it will, it, it does, it does, I would tell, it, tell that person to really think about what they're about to do. Because once you put your hand up and you take that oath, that's it. And um, um, I did three years all the time until I got to 20. And um, it wasn't easy. But once you get like five years in, three or four, I mean, uh, five, six, seven years, you can't turn back. And there was many times I wanted to, to quit and, uh, and get out, but I, but I stayed in. But I would just tell a person to really think about what they're gonna do, especially if they're a woman because everything has changed in the military now for women. I mean, women can serve now in, in combat now. And that's no joke. Mm -hmm. So you think it's different on a man than a woman? You want me to be honest? Yeah. <clears throat> well, if I was in a situation where we were being ambushed, I would think that every man there would feel um, uh, instinctively to protect her like I was over there. A lot of times women would want to go to the bathroom, so I would walk them to the bathroom and stand guard. You know, not just for uh, the enemy, which was never really around, but more so the uh, other soldiers who might get an idea. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the women over there I was protecting. My, uh, my, my daughter wanted to go in and I, I talked her out of it. In your opinion, is there anything wrong with the military? That you wish could be changed? <laughs> no, I don't know how to, how to answer that. I mean, the Army does what it does, you know, the military. I don't think I can improve on it any. I mean, it, it's good. It's good. I mean, it's something that I wouldn't do again, but I mean, it kept me out of trouble. Um, you can go into the military, you know, go to school. You know, you can get a real good education in the military. And um, you can make a, possibly make a lot of money if you um, save it. 
Looking back on your time of service, do you think you would have done anything differently? Yeah, I kept to myself more. <laughs> Hanging out with the crowd is a little... Oh. It's easy to make friends in the military, but you know, when you go into war, you know, you could lose somebody. Yeah. Uh, you know. Thank you for letting us do this interview. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.